Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Professor Naidu, our Executive Dean, Faculty of Humanities. Professor Winkler, our inductee, a special word of welcome to you. Professor Boerta, our respondent, that's also a professor in philosophy at our university. Our online audience on YouTube and Facebook. Senior leaders of the university, members of Senate and other academics. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Sunny Bonani, Guyanand, Good evening, Torbella, you are most welcome. It is indeed a great honor and special privilege for me to welcome you to the professorial inaugural lecture of Professor Winkler. As I do so, I wish to express a warm word to his loved ones, special guests and colleagues. This is indeed a proud and joyful yet a landmark moment for all of you, for Professor Winkler, and of course for us here at UJ and higher education in South Africa and beyond. The inauguration of professors is a public ceremony in which newly appointed professors are inducted into office by the Vice Chancellor and deliver the inaugural addresses. The ceremony has its root in the medieval university and serves multiple purposes. I would like to highlight two of those purposes here tonight. Firstly, it is an expression of welcome and an entry for new professors joining the circle of colleagues who are already professors. And secondly, it provides a platform for the professors to display their expertise in the discipline and showcase their research. Today we gather to bear witness to the entry of Professor Winkler to the illustrious community of scholars at our university. It is a celebration of the contributions to the discipline and ultimately the impact on society. Professors provide the university with its identity, character and academic legitimacy and integrity. The inaugural lecture is a rite of passage following the confirmation of the appointment of the person as a professor. This evening, as we will listen to Professor Winkler, as the, we say, the gown goes to town. By this, I mean that the power of the inaugural address when the expertise is showcased behind the corridors of the university and reverberates within society. It stands out as a moment of pride for the incumbent, the family, fellow scholars, the university, and ultimately society. For the German philosopher and diplomat Humboldt, a university referred to the whole community of scholars and students engaged in a common search for truth. Newman spoke about teaching universal knowledge. Recently, universities has been viewed as instrumentalist, serving the purpose of the economy or utilitarian in purpose. I would hope that we can break out of these narrow conceptualizations and reflect on the university as contributing to the public good. Edward said in an article titled On Defiance and Taking Positions, and he offers a formulation of the ideal role of a true intellectual as, and I quote, one who commands a vast knowledge of his or her discipline, who is rigorous in the analysis of literature, who views being intellectual as a vocation, the intellectual who considers it necessary to step in the public sphere and speak truth to power, namely to question, interpret, and understand authority rather than consolidating it, to step out of the boundaries of the academy to connect oneself, to affiliate oneself, to align oneself with an ongoing process or contest of some sort, perhaps with the aim of improving the lot of the oppressed. The intellectual who functions as a kind of public memory to recall what is forgotten or ignored, to make the connections that are otherwise hidden, and to provide alternatives for mistaken policies." End of quote. This evening we will listen to Professor Winkler as one further step in the journey of being a professor. Professor Winkler, this is a journey which does not culminate once this lecture has been given. It is self-reflective pause in the journey of the professor, with a promise of more to enrich our minds and simultaneously contributing to the rich intellectual body of work in the specific discipline. Let me now invite the Executive Dean, Professor Naidu, to introduce Professor Winkler. I thank you. Ria Boga, Sia Bonga, Bye Adamke.
Professor Swart, Professor Winkler, Professor Boerta, and colleagues. I have the pleasure of reading some highlights from the CV of Prof. Raphael Winkler, who is being inaugurated today. After completing his BA Honours at the University of North London in 2001, Raphael Winkler moved to the University of Warwick, where he completed his MA in Continental Philosophy and his PhD, the former in 2002 and the latter in 2007. He held various posts before joining UJ as a senior lecturer in 2012. He was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Dundee in Scotland, a temporary lecturer at Nottingham Trent University, at Nottingham University, and at the Open University in Birmingham. He was awarded a C2 NRF rating in 2015 and was the recipient of a STIAS fellowship in 2019 and of a visiting professorial fellowship from the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia in 2020. He is the co-founder and co-chair of the Centre for Phenomenology in South Africa, which was created in 2013 and which, was hosted, which has hosted speakers like Chantelle Moff, Gayathri Spivak, John Salas, Tyler Burge, and others. He's authored one monograph, over 20 articles, edited three books, and four special issues in journals. He has co-organized a one-year-and-a-half lecture series and seven international conferences. Finally, Prof. Winkler is firmly convinced of the truth of an observation Martin Heidegger once made to his students. He once said of Aristotle, he lived, he worked, he died. His point was that an author's biography is of no consequence, only his or her thought, a point that Prof. Winkler attempts to inculcate in his students at the start of each of his courses. The first thing he always tells his students is this, I don't want you to tell me in your assignment where the philosopher was born or what she's had for dinner. Evaluate her thought and tell me whether it has any merits. And with this introduction, we look forward to Prof. Winkler's inaugural address. I thank you. Happiness, we think, consists in being well adapted to reality. It consists in being well adjusted. We must be integrated into the social world by being economically fruitful and by being politically active or aware in some manner. The happy life is the well-adjusted life. It's the life well-adjusted to the needs and the demands of our 21st century urban and capitalist civilization. I will not have the occasion to speak about this idea of the happy life in this lecture, although I do so briefly in a piece published last week in the Mail and Guardian. I want to consider here and qualify my first claim, that pleasure seems to be what the mind is naturally after. To this end, it will be useful to divide pleasure into three sorts and say that there are beneficial pleasures, that is, pleasures that promote our welfare or interests as living beings, that there are harmful pleasures, that is, pleasures that detract from our interests or that put our welfare at risk, and that there are pleasures that are neither harmful nor beneficial. These pleasures do not promote our interests and they do not act against them. The question I would like to pose to begin with is whether the mind naturally pursues harmful pleasures. Is it not the case that we often find ourselves doing things that are against our interests and that bring about a certain enjoyment? Things that we know do or will do us harm. No doubt, I imagine you're thinking about the pleasure of intoxicants, the use of alcohol or drugs, Consider also the pleasure that resides in doing the illicit, the pleasure of doing wrong, of committing a crime. I'm talking about the pleasure of transgression. The two are not unrelated. The use of intoxicants is in most countries restricted by a great number of laws, being either prohibited or exorbitantly taxed. And you might wonder whether their, ap their appeal lies partly in that. It's not hard to imagine that a glass of whiskey tasted infinitely better in a speakeasy during the prohibition years in the US than after 1933. 
Going up the scale of harmful pleasures, there's a pleasure we draw from our knowingly putting ourselves in harm's way. I'm talking about the thrill you get when you risk your life, your money, or your possessions. Let me bring in two examples to clarify what I have in mind. The first is extreme sports. Gambling also comes to mind. The risk here, the risk is here the source of the excitement. The greater the risk, the greater the thrill. The second example, but this is less an example than the substance of what I want to talk about, the second example is sex. By sex I mean genital and non-genital or perverse sexuality, which, for us humans at least, is the pursuit of unalloyed pleasure. We pursue here a pleasure that has nothing in common with the necessities of life, reproduction or the demands of adaptation to the social or natural environment. We have sex not because we have to reproduce, but because it is enjoyable. We choose a partner with discretion or on the basis of certain preferences. If it was a matter of reproduction, then any member of the opposite sex would do. Now, don't we believe that sexuality is where we find the utmost pleasure? More precisely, don't we find in our culture the conviction that the sexual orgasm is the highest pleasure, the peak, the summit beyond which a greater intensity, a greater pleasure is not possible? And that it is in everything that pertains to sex or the erotic life, the ultimate or highest good. I don't mean to exclude the religious sense of this last expression. Unity with the Godhead in the mystical tradition of the East and West is always also an erotically charged experience. There is no need for me to refer you to Bernini's Ecstasy of St. Teresa, where you can see the saint in the throes of ecstasy, as she is being penetrated by God's golden spear, to remind you that religion and sexuality stem from a common emotional base. Even though, as you very well know, this is not something the orthodox teachings of the received religions today readily avow. I will assume that this conviction is true in order to ask what precisely we are after when the ultimate pleasure is our goal. For I will not presume that we know what we are talking about when we talk about pleasure, let alone the ultimate pleasure. It is simply not clear what it at bottom amounts to. But if it is true that sexuality is where we go in search of the ultimate pleasure, then I expect that sexuality should tell us something about it. It should tell us what pleasure is, both when we have sex, and pleasure is our explicit goal, and in other activities whose pleasure seems to be a substitute or a sublimated form of sexual pleasure. Now, what's more common than the frenzy of fury that accompanies the moment of release? One of the things that often strikes me about some of the characters in Saad, in Justine for example, is their orgasmic experience. It is so intense that it looks as though they're on the verge of death. They're in such fury that it's often not clear whether they're experiencing the utmost pleasure or the utmost pain, as though pain and pleasure coincided temporarily in the moment of release. Rodin, one of the characters Justine meets in her travails, is seen whipping and beating a young little girl called Julie. He then mounts her. Justine describes what she observes through the partition of the wall of the neighboring room, where she's hiding with a friend, Rosalie. And I'm quoting, he no longer knows who he is or where. His delirium has attained to such a pitch, the use of reason is no longer available to him. He swears, he blasphemes, he storms, nothing is exempt from his savage blows. All he can, ser all he can reach is treated with identical fury, but the villain pauses nevertheless. He senses the impossibility of going any further without risking the loss of the powers which he must preserve for new operations." Unquote. Rodin's orgasm disables his faculty of reason. It puts his ego momentarily out of action, as though he were dead. The highest pleasure is equivalent to temporary insanity or death. That's why I thought myself justified in classifying sex under the rubric of a harmful pleasure. The following two inferences can be drawn from what I have said, and I don't doubt that it would strike you as somewhat paradoxical. Human beings appear to be drawn to things that, in truth, can only be described as repulsive, terrifying, or as a source of disgust. What's more repulsive than death? What's more terrifying than this delirium 
And yet, I doubt that there's anything more universally sought than this intensity beyond which no other, it seems, is conceivable. The second is the apparent teleology that this implies. Is death an end we pursue? Is social life, with its constraints, the shortest path to death? Are we, human beings, at bottom suicidal? Strange conclusion, yet apparently unavoidable if our reasoning and observation are correct. The question you will naturally ask is this. Well, if all of this is true, then why don't we see people putting an end to their life all of the time? But perhaps the conclusion to be drawn is not that death is a goal we consciously adopt and pursue, like we choose to follow a career or enter a profession, but that death, disorder, frenzy, incoherence, a substitution that should no doubt have to be justified, is an unconscious, unconscious tendency. But this too requires an explanation and is paradoxical, not least because, as Freud observes in inhibitions, symptoms and anxiety and elsewhere, there's no knowledge of death in the unconscious. Which, by the way, raises some questions about Freud's speculations about there being a death drive, a compulsion to return to the inanimate state. It's as though the unconscious, the libido, was something indestructible, immortal, a non-organic life that knows no death. Or perhaps it's not that death is there as a conscious goal or unconscious tendency, but that the utmost pleasure is attained by going to the limit, or, in Bataille's words, that it is a matter of assenting to life up to the point of death. Now, we do find something like that in Saad. The mystery for me, and this is what I propose to focus on for now, is the following. Why am I fascinated by what I find repulsive? Why does something that disgusts me captivate me? I'm not just talking about myself, of course. The perception of the sexual organs of the human being usually elicits a mixed response of revulsion and attraction. Children who are shown pictures of the human anatomy in class laugh at the sight of the female and male sexual organs. Their laughter expresses the fact that they are seeing something to be taken lightly or not too seriously, and yet something that fascinates them deeply. They can't look at the pictures enough, and all you hear them say is, eek, that's so disgusting. The sight of blood has the same effect. I do not wish to list all the items that provoke this mixed response in our gut, this feeling of horror and desire, of revulsion and attraction, of disgust and captivation. It will take me too far afield and detract me from the purpose of seeing what this response can tell us about what we are after when the utmost pleasure is our goal. This will bring me to the question about the origin of sexuality. For is that not where sexuality begins for the human being? At the summit of life marked by the utmost pleasure. And perhaps everything else that makes the human being one of the more interesting animals in the cosmos begins here too. I mean the sacred and the sublime, religion and art. Edmund Burke says in a philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful that, and I'm quoting, I am convinced we have a degree of delight, and that no small one, in the real misfortunes and pain of others, unquote. I recall hearing on the news about a year or two ago, I think, that a man was shot dead in a car park in Johannesburg. A bystander from a window in an office building opposite the car park recorded the shooting on her phone and posted it online. The clip was watched by half the country in a matter of days. It is not simply that I enjoy watching the other person suffer or die. The killing is a crime and a defilement, and there is a fascination mixed with awe that keeps us riveted to the scene. But the sadist identifies with the victim in order to enjoy the rush, the fall, the vertigo of standing right by the edge of the abyss of destruction. No doubt, if the danger was too close, it would paralyze. A minimal distance is required to enjoy the thrill. It is also worth pointing out here that in connection with Burke's statement that there is more to the concept of sadism than the clinical type drawn by psychoanalysis or the characteristics listed by psychiatry in its latest version of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Sartre's principal discovery is that the object of disgust has a redeeming thrill. It stimulates our senses and arouses us. Excrement is an eroticized object. For Sartre, human sexuality, that is, the pursuit of unalloyed pleasure, does not have its origin in the imperative of survival, 
the imperative of the species to reproduce itself and multiply, human sexuality is entirely natural. It is just that nature is not bent on survival and utility so much as on destruction and waste. What awakens human sexuality facade is the combined effect of a shock on the nervous system and the imagination. He says in Philosophy in the Bedroom that, quote, the imagination is a spur of delights, and that its greatest triumph is the, its most eminent delights come of exceeding all limits imposed on it. Of all regularity, it is an enemy. It worships disorder, idolizes whatever wears the brand of crime, unquote. Eugenie, the young woman who is being seduced into libertinage says, and I'm quoting, the more we wish to be agitated, the more we desire to be moved violently, the more we must give rein to our imagination. We must bend it toward the inconceivable. Our enjoyment will thereby be increased, unquote. One of the themes of Juliette is that nothing happens in the organism, that is, nothing sexually interesting, before our senses have suffered a violent shock. Let me cite the following passage. It is exemplary of Saad's view. Saint-Fond, one of the central characters in the novel who teaches Juliette the ways of debauchery and the life of the libertine, says to her the following, and I'm quoting. To the dreary mediocre portion of mankind, leave all notions in prattle such as that righteousness and modesty must accompany fleshly pleasure. They'll fail utterly of it every time. For it cannot possibly delect save when one outsteps every limit in one's quest. The proof thereof is that there must be a breaking of restraining rules before pleasure begins to be pleasure. Go further yet, break still another, and the irritation becomes more violent, and necessarily so with each ascending step. And you do not really attain to the true goal would it these pleasure takings point until the ferment of the senses have, has reached the extremest pitch, until you have got to the final limit of what our human faculties can endure, in such wise that your nerves are so prodigiously wrought upon that they are frayed as if to paralysis, smitten into a convulsion that resembles standstill and shocked insensibility." Unquote. Sartre's discovery, as I said, is that there is a correlation between arousal and disgust. You can see this at work on two levels. It's there in the scenes in Juliette, the libertines reach orgasm at the point where they commit heinous crimes, and it mediates the reader's reception of the novel. From the descriptions of murder, incest, parasite, infanticide, and so on, to the mechanical alternation between the philosophical discourses and the sexual scenes, to Juliette's adventures, her becoming a kind of suprahuman creature as she progresses in her education as a libertine, all of it is calculated to produce a shock, terror, and no doubt, a titillation in the reader. Sartre's point is not the banality that there's no pleasure without crime or violence. It's not uncommon to be flushed with excitement and terrified at the same time when you feel the ground shaking beneath your feet. Think of the soldier on the field of battle who stares death right in the face and how this might bring about a sudden intensification of life, something comparable perhaps to a state of ecstasy. It's not that the feeling of groundlessness can be joyful and terrifying. The paradox is that joy and terror, as opposites, seem to coincide here. And I think that this is what Saint-Fond is getting at when he tells Juliette that she should go, quote, to the final limit of what our human faculties can endure, unquote, with her pleasure takings. His point is that when you push pleasure to the absolute limit, it becomes unbearable and that the ultimate in pleasure is therefore the ultimate in pain. Saad frequently comes back to the idea that pleasure is a matter of transgressing limits. This puts him within a religious setting. Christianity, as we know, reduces sexuality to the pleasures of the flesh, and it condemns it as a sin. And eroticism depends on this very condemnation. Augustine, for example, at the start of the Confessions, wonders about the passion that moved him when he was 16 to steal a bunch of pears from a tree from a neighboring vineyard. It was not from want or hunger that he stole. It was not because they looked luscious. He didn't even eat them. He dumped them out to the pigs after barely tasting some of them. Stealing pleased him because it was forbidden. The joy came from perpetrating the crime. It lay, quote, in the sin itself, unquote. That is, it lay 
in the act of violating God's laws. Now the question is whether this eroticism that consists in the pleasure of doing what's wrong is possible in an apparently secular society such as our own. What becomes of eroticism in a culture where religious prohibitions are not in force? Or where belief or where the belief in sin has waned? We are led to the same question when Saad says in the 120 days of Sodom that, and I'm quoting, the true way of extending and multiplying one's desires is to attempt to impose checks upon them, unquote. The idea is that the law does not repress desire, but that it produces it. The law brings about the desire to violate it. The law and its transgression are one and the same. It is our obedience that suppresses desire. It is our obedience that suppresses our desire to transgress the law. So that when you follow the law, when you obey it, you are effectively guilty. Your conscience is right. But now, what happens to desire when no checks are imposed? The situation I'm asking you to consider is not one where everything is permitted, but one where nothing is prohibited, a society without taboos. You may say that this is impossible, that our entrance into society at infancy is a function of the law or of the prohibition of incest and murder, and consequently, that it's impossible to enter society without becoming a subject of desire. Or you might take a different tack and object to the claim that the law generates the desire to transgress it by saying, as Zizak says of Bataille, for example, that it leads, and I'm quoting, it leads to the debilitating perverse conclusion that one is to install prohibitions in order to be able to enjoy their violation, unquote. But I think that this would be to miss the point of the question, which bears on what I think is a fairly incontestable fact, namely that religious prohibitions have lost much of their authority in most Western-style democracies, or at any rate, that are much less relevant to understand the construction of sexualities today. As far as Bataille is concerned, I have not come across a text where he proposes the course of action, such as the one Zizak attributes to him. The principal thrust of Bataille's history of eroticism, in his text called Eroticism, is precisely that it comes to an end at the dawn of the modern age, when belief in sin loses its force and sexuality becomes an object of science, that is, of clinical pathology, psychology, criminology, and so on. There's no program at the end of Bataille's text counseling the reader to introduce new prohibitions to rekindle eroticism. The message is that, barring certain instances, is pretty much dead. Bataille writes, and I'm quoting, that since eroticism was no longer a sin, and since they could no longer be certain of doing wrong, Eroticism was fast disappearing. In an entirely profane world, nothing would be left but the animal mechanism. No doubt the memory of sin might persist. It would be like feeling that there was a trap somewhere." Unquote. Eroticism seems to lose its rights in the sciencia sexualis of the moderns. Unless, of course, we want to insist that it gains new rights when so-called perverse pleasures are staged as modes of resistance to the normalization of pleasure in the bourgeois society of the 19th century, beginning perhaps with Edgar Allan Poe in his The Imp of the Perverse, The Black Cat and elsewhere, or with Baudelaire who, drawing on Poe, Joseph de Maitre and no doubt on Sartre too, constructs Les Fleurs du Mal around the idea that there's pleasure in debauchery, in death and in evil. Why, in effect, is Baudelaire so strongly opposed to the modern idea of moral, of moral progress? Well, because the term of this progress, its goal, is the eradication of sin from the world. And in Baudelaire's eyes, eroticism consists in the pleasure of doing wrong, of doing evil. So that moral progress anticipates the end of eroticism. It imagines a world without prohibitions and so without desire. A world, the sum of whose energies has been finally dissipated and entropy has reached a maximal state that of heat death. In other words, a world without sin, one where the law generates neither the desire nor the horror of transgression, is a world bereft of differences. It is a dead, immobile world. It's one that's basically incompatible with Baudelaire's eroticism. As he says in one of, these, one of the entries of Fusée, and I'm quoting, the unique and supreme sensuality of love resides in the certainty of doing evil.
and man and woman know from birth that all sensuality resides in evil. Unquote. Now, there is in Sartre more than the idea that pleasure consists in the violation of the law. Let's go back to the passage from Juliette. Saint-Fond does not tell Juliette that her pleasures will increase the more she commits to a life of crime. The emphasis is not on the transgression of a taboo, but on attaining the final limit of what our human faculties can endure. The aim, in other words, is to push pleasure to the limit, and the point at which it, at, at which it then arrives is close to the mystic's experience of ecstasy or rapture. Is this to say that eroticism in Saad terminates in a mysticism and a negative theology, in an apophatic revelation of the God as nothing, that is, as scum, semen or waste, perhaps? The significance of the coincidence of opposites in Saad's in Saad thought, which I cannot go into here, speaks in its favour. The question I want to briefly consider is whether Teresa of Avila, a mystic, if not an apophatic one, brings about what Saint-Fond encourages Juliette to do in her libertinage. So let's turn from the libertine to the Christian mystic, briefly, and to conclude this presentation. There are two passages in the saint's autobiographical book that I want to look at to flesh out this idea of the limit of pleasure. This will perhaps cast another light on the link between religion and sexuality and show that not everything about it has been said once we've made the observation that eroticism consists in the pleasure of violating taboos. In the first passage, in chapter 20, she says that her ecstasy was a state of delight mixed with fear. Why fear? Because when you're in ecstasy, she says, everything is at stake. Your life hangs in the balance. You're being carried away, but, quote, you know not whither, unquote. And she continues, quoting her again, the weakness of our nature at first makes us afraid of it, and we need not and we need to be resolute and courageous in soul. Whatever happens, we must risk everything and resign ourselves into the hands of God and go willingly wherever we are carried away, whether we like it or not." Unquote. What's risked is the ego, that is, the agency in charge of the faculties of the senses and of reason and of the motility of the body. It is the ego that secures the welfare of the human being and its adaptation. And it is this that's imperiled by rapture. For she says, and I'm quoting, while the subject rarely loses consciousness, and I have sometimes lost it altogether, but only seldom and for but a short time, consciousness is nevertheless, as a rule, disturbed." Unquote. It is on the one hand incapable of doing anything with the body or with regards to external things. All of its motor functions are inhibited. Action is impossible. One is paralyzed. And on the other hand, the subject is unable to exercise its sensory and rational faculties. Though the subject, quote, can still hear and understand, but only dimly, as though from a long way off, when ecstasy is at its highest point, this is no longer possible. By highest point, she says, I mean when the faculties are lost through being closely united with God. At this point, the subject is unable to see, hear or understand. As I said, she says, as I said in describing the preceding prayer of union, this complete transformation of the soul in God lasts but a short time, and it is only what it lasts that none of the soul's faculties is able to perceive or know what is taking place." Unquote. Who or what remains there to enjoy the ecstasy? It is certainly a legitimate question to ask. Is it right to speak of non-egoic enjoyments or satisfactions? Matters become more complicated when we realize that this ecstasy that she's been describing in chapter 20 is sexual. It's as though sexuality begins not with the ego, but beyond it, beyond its language and its interests, that is to say, beyond the living being's attachment to life. She says in chapter 29, the chapter that inspired, among others, the Italian sculptor Benini, that she was pierced in her heart several times by God's golden spear, at the end of which she seemed to see a point of fire. She felt the spear going so deeply inside her that, I'm quoting, it penetrated to my entrails. When God drew it out, I thought he was drawing out my entrails with it, and he left me completely afire with a great love of God. The pain was so sharp that it made me utter several moans, and so excessive was the sweetness caused me by this intense pain 
that one can never wish to lose it, nor will one's soul be content with anything less than God." Unquote. Let's not misunderstand what she's saying. She's not talking about the paradox of pleasure and pain. She's saying that her feeling of being entered by God is so intense that it's unendurable. It's an enjoyment of the greatest intensity and pain because it obliterates her ego. Recovering from her rapture several days following the experience, she says that she went as if in a stupor. I'm quoting, I had no wish to see or speak with anyone, but only to hug my pain, which caused me greater bliss than any that can come from the whole of creation. I was like this on several occasions, when the Lord was pleased to send me these raptures. And so deep were they that, even when I was with other people, I could not resist them. So greatly to my distress, they began to be talked about." Unquote. I don't want to give the impression that my interpretation should or could have removed the enigma of her experience. It is incomprehensible. And this is, of course, what this study is about, namely to try to surround the ultimate pleasure with certain texts and certain markers in my reading of those texts in order to make it perhaps not less incomprehensible, but point out the question, the problem it poses. I wanted to hug my pain, she says, and this, her pain, she says, caused me greater bliss than any that can come from the whole of creation." Unquote. Her enjoyment transcends the pleasures procured by things both sensuous and supersensuous. Its correlate is the nothing from which God creates. And we may wonder whether this is why it slips into its opposite, that is, into pain, because, namely, her ecstasy brings her soul to the limit right before the nothing. At any rate, it is clear that the words are failing here, or more precisely, that her discourse tries to fill this gap that resists language and meaning, consciousness and the signifier. The problem posed by her sexuality, that is, by her orgasmic enjoyment, pain, is that it's unthinkable. It is the traumatic nucleus around which her discourse on God, rapture, distress and so on, organizes itself. It returns to it again and again in a variety of ways without, however, reaching it. And perhaps that's what makes her discourse so authentic, if I can use this time-worn word, the fact, namely, that it's aware of failing to speak about it. Thank you. It is a great honor to be the invited respondent this evening, an evening of great significance in the life of an intellectual. I have but a few moments to provide a response, and so I will give brief remarks on only two of the strands of thinking that Professor Winkler has so deftly teased out for us in his address. To introduce the strands, I want to start with a distinction inspired by Ted George, a distinction between the idea of the committed intellectual, given to us by Jean-Paul Sartre, and the idea of philosophical interpretation, hermeneutics, as an ethical calling. As is well known, Sartre's vision of the committed intellectual is one where the intellectual is always responsible to respond to the social and other injustices of their time. Sartre's intellectual must engage and not remain in their proverbial ivory tower. Now, Sartre's own highly contentious exploits as a committed intellectual reveal one of the difficulties that comes with his idea, that when one's focus is only on being committed, it is particularly easy to be blind to one's own prejudices. And of course, I'm using this word in both its colloquial and Gadamerian uh, senses here. Now, Sartre's idea stands in contradistinction to another way of understanding the work of the intellectual. Hermeneutics, the pursuit of understanding ourselves, others, texts and concepts by means of interpretation, can be understood in any number of ways. 
but I want to suggest, passe George, that it can be understood rather as an ethical calling. If we then see the work of the intellectual in this way, the prejudices that were so troublesome in Sartre's conception of the intellectual can be rehabilitated in at least two senses. Firstly, prejudices are rehabilitated in the sense of being seen as what grants the very possibility of interpretation in the first place. This is, of course, Gadamer. Secondly, the interpreter is asked to come into the hermeneutical circle in the right way. And this is, of course, Heidegger and Gadamer. How? In a minimal sense, as a way to be at least aware of the danger of being merely committed, and in a stronger sense, as a way to hear the call of conscious, conscience, as Heidegger so eloquently and mysteriously puts it, when we partake in, in, in any interpretive activity. I want to, perhaps willfully, read Professor Winkler's address this evening as an exercise in interpretation, a hermeneutic effort, and so as one that can be understood in the light of interpretation seen as an ethical calling. His engagement with themes that we often shy away from, sexuality, religion, pleasure, is, I think, the very first mark of such an endeavour. But seeing the work of the intellectual in the way I'm suggesting also brings me to the first strand of thinking I want to highlight in Professor Winkler's interpretation. His interpretation brings together two texts that would not normally be read together, Saad's Justine and Bernini's Ecstasy of St. Teresa. Winkler tells us that it is precisely because religion and sexuality stem from a shared emotional base that these texts can indeed be read together. And he has given us some wonderful ideas in showing just how that could look. But what he's saying is going further still. He's saying that it is our desire for the utmost pleasure that reveals the links between religion and sexuality the link between the sacred and the sublime, the link between religion and art, their shared source. Now, bringing together these elements of human existence is not new. We already see this kind of effort in the thinking of the ancient Greeks. But perhaps most strikingly, we can find it in the work of the early Nietzsche, who sees in music and in dance, those arts he calls the Dionysian arts, the depth of life its sustaining source as symbolically expressed. This notion of intoxication, which Winkler variously characterizes as the risk, excitement, the pleasure of transgression, is used by Nietzsche to express the non-rational way of making contact with reality. And this is described by Nietzsche in terms of the chaos he calls the Dionysian. By highlighting what I want to push as the Dionysian aspect of sexuality, religion and art, Winkler seems to me to be in accord with Jean-Luc Nancy, who argues that sex is sex to the extent that it is the expression of an excessive imperative. In other words, one that cannot be satisfied. For Nancy, as it is, I think, for Winkler, sex is then closer to art and language than it is to any finite empirical experience. But I think Winkler stands closer to Nancy in another way. When Winkler explains, using Baudelaire, that moral progress imagines a world without prohibitions and so a world without desire, it becomes the end of eroticism. He stands close to Nancy in the sense that Nancy similarly reminds us that we are more comfortable with the drama of prohibitions, repression, and destruction, which often ha hamper thinking about sex, than we are with the affirmation of an originary trouble at the limits of language that divides being and opens up the world. Now, if I had more time this evening, I would want to dwell on the seductive idea of moral progress and its relation to sexuality, the highest pleasure and language, but it will have to suffice for me at this point to assert that it is here, I think, that Winkler's interpretive efforts reveal the work of the hermeneut 
as an ethical one. I think this takes place specifically in terms of his questioning of what I see as the unmitigated proliferation of rhetoric about progress in a world that has become driven by technology and globalization. So instead of heading in the direction of progress, I end my response by highlighting the second strand of thinking that really stands out for me in Winkler's address. And this is, of course, the idea that he ends with, the idea of an authentic discourse as being one that is aware of its failure to speak. As Winkler himself points out, the word authentic has become so hackneyed that it has almost completely lost any meaning. It is employed almost everywhere today, from authentic eating plans to authentic self-help programs to authentic education and authentic assessment. But in telling us that an authentic discourse is aware of its very failure to speak, Winkler again returns us to the work of Heidegger. Heidegger distinguishes, as is well known, between authentic and inauthentic forms of existential discourse. The authentic form Heidegger calls saying, and the inauthentic form he calls idle talk. Saying is for Heidegger our ability to remain responsible for our speech by remaining silent <coughs> in order to listen and genuinely respond to the voice of being. Idle talk is the opinionated chatter unmindful of the claim of other Daseins. For Heidegger, language becomes idle talk when the speaker ceases to respond individually to the address of the other and is content to correspond to the anonymous chatter of public opinion. The existential responsibility of each eye capitulates to the unthinking influence of the crowd, does man. Human being's speech ceases to be authentically her own. Her existence is no longer lived by her. It is lived for her by the impersonalized Dasman. And I think perhaps it is here that Winkler's linking of sexuality and language can best be read as an ethical calling. It is for me, as I read it, a call for a reconsideration of sexuality, the concept of the highest pleasure and eroticism in our response to the silent address of the other. I thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as if we listen to our inductee and the respondent, I'm sure you all would have seen this beautiful gown behind me here. What we're going to do now is we've listened to the inaugural address, we've had a respondent, we've got acknowledgement on the depth of knowledge, the true intellectual nature of the, res of the address, and we're going to rope the incumbent now, the Professor Winkler, with the gown and camp, and this will then donate, uh, 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 denote that the professorship has been formally assumed. I call on the dean and Professor Winkler to come. Let's do the robing. We've come to the end of our proceedings, but please allow me to make a few thanks. First of all, 
Uh, sincere thanks to Professor Winkler for sharing his thoughts with us for that inaugural address. I uh, think it's a, a journey, it's a difficult journey, a challenging journey to wear that gown, Professor Winkler. We know it doesn't come easy, but we want to thank you for sharing your knowledge with us and many congratulations once again. Well deserved. Also, Professor Boerta, for your response, but also asking you questions in your response. It's much appreciated and thank you very much. Professor Naidu, as Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, thank you for creating an environment that support our staff to flourish and to move through the ranks to become full professors within our university. It is much appreciated. Our own online audience, thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate your time with us here tonight. Although you're not physically here with us, it's much appreciated. And then everybody had played a role in the facilitation and ensuring that this, uh, that this event uh, took place tonight. It's also much appreciated. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay safe, take care, do wear your mask, sanitize, wash your hands, and keep a safe distance. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Good night. The University of Johannesburg. The future reimagined.